Um, welcome to the First League of Women Voters Massachusetts Meet the Specialists presentation. Today's topic is women's issues. My name is Susan Lafredo, and my, my partner- My name's Jan Soma. Hi. Um, and today's, um, I'm sorry, we are the legislative specialists for women's issues. Jan and I are the leg legislative specialists for women's issues. It's a mouthful. Okay, thank you. We also have joining us, um, helping out legislative specialist Jen Muroff, who is our tech expert today. And Kathy Leonardson is also here. She's chair of the Legislative Action Committee, which you'll hear about in a second. And Taylor Grenga, Administrative and Program Associate at the League is also on the, um, on the, on the program. Um, we welcome your questions after each segment of the presentation and um, are asking that you please enter them in the chat. It'll help us keep organized that way. If we don't get to every question during the meeting, we will definitely follow up with a response and we will also follow up with some information we think will be helpful to you. Last note, we will be recording this presentation as you probably saw. And so please feel free to keep your video off and everyone please stay muted um, unless you're speaking. Okay. Um, the Legislative Action Committee is a um, group of 25 legislative specialists in different areas. Um, what do we do? We identify and advocate for or against bills um, that are brought up in the Mass Legislature every two years. Um, our legislature in Massachusetts is on a two-year cycle and they introduce, oh, roughly about 7,000 bills per session. So how in the world would we choose the handful that we're able to, or the more than a handful, but the subset that, that we're able to support and follow? Um, one of the main guiding lights are the is, or two of the main guiding lights are the position statements of the Massachusetts League and the National League. These positions have been um, developed, discussed, voted on, and um, documented in the um, statements, the position statements that, that both organizations um, follow. So that is really helpful. Um, it's also a question of what are the bills we think uh, could use our help or could um, be close to being passed or are important particularly to us for a variety of reasons. Um, the Legislative Action Committee is a starting point for the League's state legislative advocacy. We have the LAC, Legislative Action Committee or LAC, has regular meetings. Um, each specialist presents the bills that she is interested in having the league support. We discuss, we vote on official support. If okayed, the specialist writes testimony and attends the hearings and may present the testimony orally. In any case, the testimony is um, submitted to the relevant committee. Um, legislative specialists also help plan and participate in other events. Um, including lobbying events like Day on the Hill. Um, they participate or we participate in coalitions that are relevant to our interest area as well. So that's what the LAC is, what the legislative specialists are. And now to go to our bill presentation, I will turn over to Jan. Hi everyone. I'm uh, looking forward to presenting um, a bill to you. It's called an act relative to transparency in the workplace. The goal of this legislation is to equalize pay by gender and race. Before I explain what's exactly in the bill, I want to share some history of past legislation addressing pay discrimination by gender. <laughs> then I will talk about why this legislation is needed. And finally, go on to discuss the details of this bill and why it has a chance to really make a difference. The US Congress passed the Equal Pay Act in 1963. This law made it illegal for employees to pay men more than women performing the same job. Yet more than 50 years later, a gender gap, wage gap persists. 
For almost 25 years now, the Paycheck Fairness Act, HR 7, has been considered by our US Congress. It is a labor bill that would add procedural protections to the Equal Pay Act, the one that I mentioned before that was passed in 1963, to improve the gender pay gap in the United States. The National Partnership for Women and Families has determined that mothers are primary or sole breadwinners in just over half of US households with children. And of the nearly 8.2 households headed by women, nearly one quarter have an income below the poverty level. As a group, the wage gap costs women who are employed full-time in the United States more than $956 billion a year. Women and families could really use the provisions of this bill. The US House recently passed the Paycheck Fairness Act. Unfortunately, it failed to get the 60 Senate votes needed to move the legislation forward for consideration. So for now, it's up to the states to pass laws that promote equal pay for women. Across the US, there have been major new pay equity laws uh, passed recently. California, Colorado, and Illinois are the most recent that I'm aware of. Notably, both California and Illinois will require that employees report pay data. This new type of pay equity law provision in the United States um, allows for the prosecution of employers. There is also a trend towards pay equity around the globe. In one study of 64 countries, 21 have pay equity reporting requirements. The European Union, Union is now considering requiring gender pay gap reporting. Germany, France, and Iceland have already done so. Great Britain uh, passed a law in 2016 that took, play, took effect in 2017. So we have data from 2018 onward. The news is good. Women's wages have improved relative to men. It is noteworthy that since women have more information about companies, uh, which companies pay fairly and promote women to higher positions, they are choosing to apply for jobs at the companies with better pay and advancement records. In the United States, the National Committee on Pay Equity has compiled data comparing men's and women's wages from 1960 through 2019. What they found is that the wage gap has been closing, but at a very slow rate. In 1963, women who worked full-time earned 59 cents on, the, on average for every dollar earned by men. In 2019, women earned 82 cents on the dollar compared to men. Over the past 40 years, the meaning Mean, median earnings of individual women have fallen sh between, short between $700,000 and $2 million for each individual over their lifetime because of gender pay inequities. Without some kind of intervention, the National Committee on Pay Equity predicts that women won't have wage parity with men until 2059. That's 28 years from now. The prediction was made before the COVID-19 crisis. Most experts are now saying that they expect parity will take longer than 28 years because women were especially hit hard during the pandemic. Going now to Massachusetts, in 1945, we became the first state in the country to pass an equal pay law. The Commonwealth updated this law in 2016. The new law is called the Massachusetts Equal Pay Act. It provides clarity on what is unlawful discrimination and adds new protections to ensure that workplace pay practices are fair for women. For example, employers can't ask prospective female employees about their previous salaries. And the law specifies that workers should be paid the same for work that requires substantially similar skill, effort, and responsibility, not just the exact same job. This means that workers must be paid the same, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm repeating myself. Um, the law is considered among the best in the country, but it does not require disclosures from businesses about whether they're actually paying women fairly. Just a great concern to me here. In fact, employers are not required to even conduct self-evaluations and are not penalized for not doing so. 
employers are not required to look at their own data so that they can plead ignorance if they're sued for uh, discrimination. Without public pay data, it's more difficult to prove wage discrimination if a particular employee chooses to sue for damages. And without this data, it's not clear to prospective employees which companies are best to work for. Our aggregated pay data in Massachusetts shows that women earn 83 cents on the dollar compared to their male coworkers. I might add that this is pretty much true across the whole United States. So it's not unique to Massachusetts, but this is our data. Asian women earn 84 cents on the dollar. The ratio is much worse for other groups of women. Native American women earn 64 cents. African American women earn 59 cents and Latinas earn just 51 cents on the dollar compared to men. In Massachusetts, the Boston Women's Workforce Council has evaluated wage um, data for, from 250 employers that have reported gender and racial wage gap, gaps anonymously since 2013. Sadly, they report that greater Boston employers wage gaps have actually increased in the last few years from 23 cents to 30 cents for all women, while black and Hispanic women earned 49 cents and 45 cents respectively compared to white men. So despite our great labor laws, we still have big significant wage disparities. disparities. Now that I've set the scene, uh, I'll describe the bill that we have before our legislature. Again, it's an act relative to transparency in the workplace. Representatives Liz Malia and Liz Miranda and Senator Paul Feeney are the lead sponsors. It had a hearing before the Joint Committee on Labor and Workforce Development, but they have not voted on it yet. There are three main provisions that I'll mention about this bill. It will require all entities that employ 100 or more full-time workers to evaluate wage data by gender, race, and ethnicity annually. This is called the wage gap. It is the difference in average total compensation between employee groups. Race has been included because women of color have suffered twice and their wages reflect that. They are women of color and they have discrimination based on that and they're women, obviously. Businesses must, the second big provision here is businesses must report the proportions of the top 10 earners by gender, race, and ethnicity. So the top 10 earners in the company must be publicly disclosed, uh, not the names of the people, but how much money they make and what their race and ethnicity are. This data will help businesses and the public pay attention to whether women and women of color are advancing to higher paid positions in a company. This is one of the main reasons for a gender gap in pay because women have not been advancing to higher levels, which include higher pay in companies at the same rate as men. The third feature is really key, it's transparency. Businesses must submit their pay data to the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development, which would make the information available to the public. So everyone would know which companies are doing better by women and people in various ethnic groups uh, compared to other companies for the first time in Massachusetts. So going back to our data on Great Britain, this bill looks like a winner. Wages for women are improving in Great Britain after pay, public pay data disclosure was required by law. We don't have information from the other countries because the laws are too recent. Most companies across Massachusetts have gender wage discrepancies, even when their executives think they don't. So well-meaning as well as not so well-meaning companies are likely to make wage changes if this bill becomes law. Otherwise, they are likely to be prosecuted more often and lose out on highly qualified women who choose to apply for work elsewhere. I hope you like this bill as much as I do and will consider lending your support to help it move through our legislative session. 
So I'd like to answer, uh, do my best to answer any questions that you might have. And um, let's see, uh, let me look in the chat and see what we've got. Uh, the question is, is the gender gap, pay gap different for women with children as opposed to women without children? We don't have that data. Um, I, I, I do know that if women need to take some time off from work, um, people who have taken time off go back to lower wages. So for example, we do have data that shows, which is relevant to the pandemic, if people uh, have taken a year off from work, they tend to go back to 4% less uh, in terms of their salary. And if they take more time off, um, they, the pay is uh, worse than that. So that is something that we do have. Yeah. Um, so if I could just follow up on that. Yes. Um, I only know about, um, I only know, know about it with um, academic advancement of women in science. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge difference for women with children as opposed to women without children. Oh, that's in important. Their, so in terms of their advancement. One of the things that we're going to do is give you our personal emails, Susan and my emails, and that would be great to have that as a reference um, as I continue studying this. Uh, disappointing data like that is comes from every direction. And um, the more we know, the more we can encourage legislators to form bills in the future that really make sense for women. So let me see, um, what is the bill numbers? Okay. Um, Taylor, yeah, actually, um, Jen is going to put that in the chat. So we'll have that for later. Um, Okay. All right. Will you send a link to the recording to all of today's participants? Um, yes, we're hoping to do that. We're going to have a follow up email with all of our materials, and we would like to uh, send the link of the recording as long as it comes out. Um, oh, Susan, you already answered that. Thank you. Okay. okay, so I don't see any more questions. Um, if anyone has one, please um, let us know what it is now. And when I finish, we'll go on to Susan. Oh, there is one here. I see another question. How will this state bill impact workers in Massachusetts for companies based in other states where their benefits? where their benefits come from. Um, the, this is just going to be uh, from Massachusetts. We can take heart that some other states are passing legislation with some transparency as well. And this just happened in the last year or so. So there's, there's a trend starting up, uh, probably because we're seeing from uh, Great Britain that it makes a difference. Um, so hopefully more and more states are going to be uh, producing this kind of legislation. All right, well, if you have any more questions for later, you can always ask uh, in the chat. And if we don't get to them, we will answer after the presentation is completed. But for now, let's go to Susan, who's going to present her uh, bills on women's health care regarding uh, reproduction. Reproductive. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Ben. I um, just wanted to just wanted to say I have. Um, I'll add some resources to our letter on um, on pay inequity um, that I've I've looked into. And um, Barbara, I've seen a lot of the maybe studies that you have on women in academe because that was my old life. And um, make sure that you have these resources too. So. Thank you. Um, so the, there are two bills that I'm going to speak about. The first one 
is an act to require public universities to provide medication abortion on campus. Um, the sponsors are in the Senate, Jason Lewis, and um, in the House, um, Lindsay Sabadosa. So it's the bill is exactly what the title says. It requires universities to designate facilities and personnel on campus to perform medication abortions. Um, most, if not all, you know, public universities and colleges have health service where there is a facility that is just a private room, which is necessary, and personnel which who can be um, an MD, a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, or a nurse um, can all provide this, this service. Um, there was a virtual public hearing of the Joint Committee on Public Health on June 7th, and we, the League, did testify or submitted our testimony. Um, there's been no progress since then, so we're, we're waiting to see where that goes. This bill was also filed last session in 2019, also didn't go any further than committee. Um, one piece of good news is that the UMass system is supportive of this bill, and so we have fingers crossed that it will, will be successful. There is a similar, a very similar law in California that will take um, effect in 2020. And um, <clears throat> the uh, a delegation of um, Massachusetts legislators did consult quite a bit with the California legislators to see what they would advise and how the, the progress of the bill has gone and what their research was. So it's an informed, um, an informed piece of legislation that they wrote up. To be um, thorough, let me just say a few words about medication abortion. It is a safe and effective method of terminating a pregnancy within the first 10 weeks of gestation. Um, it was approved by the FDA in 2000. So we have 20 plus years of this um, procedure to, to judge from and it is overwhelmingly safe and effective. Um, Interestingly, the mean time that it takes a person to recognize that she is pregnant is six weeks. So from that six weeks, there's a window of four weeks within which you have to figure out where your care is coming from, how you're paying for it, and get yourself there in order to be able to take advantage of this, um, this, this procedure. 60% of abortion care for 20 to 24 year olds is medication abortion. Um, and this is from the Guttmacher Institute, which if you're um, interested in women's um, reproductive health, it's a great, great place to look for research. Um, there's a big benefit in terms of privacy. Um, with a medication abortion, you go into a clinic or um, prescribed um, your medication, you take first medication um, in the clinic, 24 to 36 hours later, you take the second medication at home, which causes the um, emptying of the uterus and nobody has to know what you're doing. So it's very attractive for that reason. Why do we need medication abortion on campus? Well, it's not that simple. People say, oh yeah, I'll, some people call it the abortion pill. It's not just a pill you pick up at the drugstore, easy peasy. You um, do need a clinic appointment. Um, and for students, figuring out where to seek care is one of the logistical issues. Is this place that you have Googled and saw the word abortion in? Um, is it a fake abortion clinic where their goal is to talk you out of having an abortion or is it really a healthcare center? That's, that's one hurdle. Transportation is another. For example, um, because most students don't have cars, um, public transportation is probably gonna be the way that they, they get to their appointments, which is not a big deal. You can be on public transportation having take, taken the medication, but um, the distance may be. Um, UMass Amherst, for example, is 25 miles 
from the nearest abortion provider. And if you're going by public transportation, it's two and a half hours by bus, one way, five hours appointment. That's a whole day off school that you need to take. Um, they're not always um, weekend appointments and they're almost always a wait for the appointment. So this equals delay in receiving care. Now, if I just figured out I was pregnant at six weeks and I have to wait three, four, I make a decision about what I want to do, um, then that six weeks turns into 10 weeks very easily, 11 weeks, and, and then I do not have the option of my chosen um, care. And at 12 plus weeks, it's an aspiration um, abortion. At 15 <clears throat> plus weeks, it's a DE, and those are um, more costly procedures. So, and take place in the clinic and are not as private and may not be what the, the woman or a uh, pregnant person is most comfortable with. So, um, and an off-campus provider may not accept student insurance. So there's another additional cost issue. I don't mean to imply that these will be, these um, abortions would be free. The medication abortion would be free on campus. The cost has not been um, determined yet. The bill does establish a fund, however, to help pay for um, the, <clears throat> to help pay for whatever facility um, adjustments, uh, equipment, et cetera, needs to be like a speculum. I mean, very simple equipment needs to be added. Um, and so we will find out uh, if this bill is passed. Having a child while in college really makes a dent in one's educational attain attainment um, the Institute of Women's Policy Research um, found that 53% of parents leave school without a degree within six years versus 31% of non-parents. So that's a, a healthy chunk of people who don't finish school because they have, um, they have given birth. 61% of those who give birth while in school don't finish. It is really in everyone's interest for students to complete their education and be better um, contributing citizens of the Commonwealth. So the league positions that support this are um, the league is behind the freedom to make informed reproductive decisions consistent with people's beliefs. Um, the league supports access to family planning information, services and devices to people who want them. The league supports treating abortion as a medical procedure. And importantly, the league supports public funding for both um, birth control and abortion services for the poor. So, and I'll give you the number. I don't know if you're asking, but it's H2399S1470, Act to Require Public Universities to Provide Medication Abortion. There is another bill that we're looking at very carefully and um, Rep Sabadosa is also the, a sponsor of this bill. The Senate sponsor is um, Cindy Friedman, Senator Cindy Friedman. This bill um, would require all public and private Massachusetts health insurance plans, all public and private mass health insurance plans to cover prenatal delivery, postpartum and abortion care with no deductible, no copay, no shared, um, no shared payment by the patient at all. Church employers are exempted from this, okay? It was filed in the House in February, 2021. There was a hearing at the beginning of July and there is no action yet. Um, similar bills were filed in the previous session. The, I think the House and Senate bill were a little bit different, um, but there was, they died in committee. Um, there are six other states that have um, some level of re required abortion coverage. Four of those have um, no copay by the, uh, by the pregnant person, or excuse me, yes, by the pregnant person. 
you may think, okay, we have a really insured population. Well, yes, we do. 97% of Massachusetts women, 97% had health insurance as of 2019, but cost is still an issue to reproductive care. Why? Deductibles, co-pays. Um, and there is no federal funding of abortion um, through Medicaid. That's because of the Hyde Amendment, which was resurrected when we we're thinking about Joe Biden's history. And this was 1977. Um, but states may fund from their own state fund and Massachusetts happens um, to do that. Some of the mass health plans cover abortion. Um, of privately insured people, 57% have at least a $1,000 deductible. And if you think about it, the less expensive healthcare plans are um, the ones with the larger deductibles for the most part. And so a person who is least likely to have a, a lot of money on hand will probably get hit with the biggest deductibles. And this um, will often delay care because um, people are trying to beg and borrow and sell their belongings to make up the money that they need for, um, for their delivery of their baby or for uh, an abortion of their pregnancy. And um, maybe they forego prenatal care at all. Maybe they forego postnatal care. Um, so there is a real need for affordable pregnancy care, comprehensive affordable pregnancy care. Um, black women in Massachusetts are twice as likely as white women to die from complications of pregnancy because of the inaffordability of appropriate care. So we're talking about a matter of life and death here. <clears throat> At least ten percent. At least ten percent of women experience depression after childbirth, and there is a rising suicide rate among this population. Um, Low-income women and women of color suffer poorer access to services and higher rates of suicide and maternal death from all causes. Again, affordability equals access equals good outcomes. The league position we support. Access, and again, access just doesn't only mean the clinics down the street, it means I can afford it. To a basic level of quality health care for all US residents, we support public funding for birth control and abortion services for the poor. We have opposed attempts of abortion opponents to limit access and increase cost by restricting abortions to hospitals rather than clinics. Um, so that is H1196 S673, an act ensuring access to full spectrum pregnancy care. Uh, to wrap up, I just wanna give a little bit of context. Um, start with Roe versus Wade, uh, 1973 legislation that um, sprang from a Texas case that, that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the ruling was on privacy that um, abortion must be allowed um, because it's a private decision of the pregnant person. Um, it must be allowed before viability. Anyway, there was a caveat. Shortly after, almost immediately after, um, opponents began chipping away at this right by different kinds of um, restrictions and um, this year, first half of 2021, there have been 90 new restrictions implemented in different states across the country um, to take away women's right to their abortion care. For example, there is a ban at six weeks in Idaho, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Texas. Remember what I said, six weeks, your first discovering for the most part that you're pregnant. This is called the heartbeat bill. Heartbeat, there is no heart at six weeks. There's a muscle that shivers a little bit. 
Um, so there is an all out push to prevent um, this fundamental right. We have um, upcoming, as you probably know, there's a suit called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, and it will be heard by the Supreme Court next term. Um, Mississippi had a 15 week ban and the Jackson Women's Health Organization um, challenged it. They won a suit in state court to rule it unconstitutional and Mississippi is taking this to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed to hear it and um, will in the next term. So we will see um, what, what that brings us. Okay, um, I am going to look at the questions now. Oh, the state. Okay. Okay, thanks. Taylor gave the numbers. Okay, would the public university, okay. Would the public university health services supply the pill or does the person have to fill the prescription at a pharmacy? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I will see if that is known. I am not sure whether the detail, details like that would be worked out. I would assume, you know what, I, I'm pretty sure, in fact, thinking about the way this is done, that the pills will be, the first and second pill will both be supplied by the, um, the health services. And that does go to privacy. It also goes to the timing. The first pill um, needs to be taken within a certain time of the second, or the second medication needs to be taken within a certain time of the first. So generally clinician will give the sec first pill, the pregnant person will take that in their presence and then take home the second pill with instructions on when to take the second medication. Um, and thank you, Taylor. Um, to get the medication abortion, must the students be a student at the public universities or can all students take advantage of this as long as they have proof of being a student at any college or public university? I can only guess and I will um, see if I can verify this and then put it in our email. I would imagine that this is a benefit for students of the public universities. Um, but it's a great question. And I wonder if that could be part of the bill, um, extending that to all students. Um, mind you, there are, um, I mean, there, are, there would be other places and it may not be that easy for a student at um, BU to access, well, BU could go to UMass Boston, I guess. Yeah, my answer is, I don't know, I will look it up. Um, and thanks for your questions. Um, now, I think I will turn, yeah, I think it's time to turn it back to Jan, who will be talking about some of our other, um, uh, our other legislation. Thank you, Susan. Um, all right, I'm going to screen share. Okay, great. So I'm going to start by giving a little history of some bills that um, have been endorsed and advocated for by the League of Women Voters. And I just, uh, the last few sessions. Um, so in 2000, uh, the 2015, 16 legislative session, the equal pay law that um, I highlighted earlier was supported by us and it did pass. In the 2017-18 legislative session, rights for pregnant workers passed. This is a really important bill. Women were expected to carry 200 pounds when they were seven months pregnant, uh, if they were working in a warehouse. Things like that are no longer uh, in the heat, uh, you know, terrible, terrible circumstances. Uh, that is no longer legal. Um, the disability um, insurance uh, equity Representative Ruth Balser had this, I think, as a bill for 20 years, and it finally passed uh, in the 
1718 legislative session. It's the last insurance bill that uh, had discrimination uh, based on gender for the rates uh, that you had to pay for that insurance. Um, another bill was insurers must provide contraceptives without copays or deductibles. Um, this obviously is kind of ties into what Susan was talking about. Um, it, women really uh, have no questions asked when they go to insurers now, and they can each, even get a year's worth of contraceptives at a time um, if they um, ask for it. Um, there were a couple of bills that had to do with taking um, uh, archaic bills off, off the uh, laws of Massachusetts, um, uh, you know, contraception wasn't allowed and, uh, you know, abortion wasn't allowed, all kinds of things. Physicians could be sued for this or that. Adultery was prosecutable. Um, so uh, that paved the way for the Roe Act, uh, which uh, uh, was addressed in our last session. Um, the Roe Act didn't pass, but provision, many provisions of the Roe Act did uh, get inserted into our budget. And uh, so we, last year was the only, we were the only state last session that actually helped women get abortions. All the other states either took away rights or didn't advance women's uh, rights. So we now have abortion codified and uh, we are, I think we're be all better off for it. Um, and the final one, Susan uh, made some reference to uh, African-American women are two times more likely to die uh, having to do with something to do with pregnancy than white women. And so a commission has been established to address why and uh, suggest ways that we can change that. Um, and I can't wait to see what they come up with. So that was some of our recent legislation. And what I'd like to do now is to let you know uh, what other bills we have on our docket um, at the League of Women Voters Women's Issues um, uh, section. So um, equal pay, I talked about that. Susan talked about health insurance coverage for all pregnancy related care and medication abortions available at public universities. But we have several other bills um, that we are supporting. One is parity for gender and race on public boards. Uh, this would require um, proportional uh, representation of women and uh, different racial groups on our public boards. There are a couple of exceptions, but most every board. Um, harassment pre prevention in the workplace, and this includes sexual harassment, but other kinds of harassment as well. A ban on mandatory arbitration for sexual harassment and assault claim in workplaces. 40% uh, of workers have, um, have to use arbitration um, and uh, rather than sue in our courts. Um, and um, so this bill would address that. No cost menstrual products. This is one that has a lot of um, support across the um, Commonwealth and a lot of young women are getting uh, uh, their two cents in and saying how it would be helpful for them. And I saw some 14, 16 year olds uh, testifying at, at their hearing for this and it was, it, it warms the heart to see them activated. Um, <clears throat> another one is age appropriate, medically accurate sex education in schools. This seems like a no brainer, brainer. it's been around forever. Uh, but it hasn't passed yet, and it can really use our support. Um, Senator Becca Rausch um, is the lead sponsor for an independent commission to investigate statehouse sexual harassment and abuse. Um, so that completes the list. Uh, we couldn't talk about each one of them today. Um, the summaries for these bills uh, are on, on our website, the League of Women Voters Massachusetts Legislative Agenda. Here's the link. Um, Jen is also putting the link on the ch in the chat and we'll follow up uh, with an email with this as well. I wanna stress that equal pay, parity for gender and race on public boards and no cost menstrual products, 
each have a coalition. One of the things that you probably realize is that the more people who are uh, advocating for a particular piece of legislation, the more likely it is to be successful. These uh, bills have really good coalitions behind them. And we are putting this information in the chat as well. Um, okay, so Jen, if we could go to spotlighting me now, I'll stop sharing. There I am, okay. So I wanted to talk about a couple of things having to do with advocacy. Um, first, Susan and I are sharing our emails and they'll be in the chat. We want you to reach out to us for any questions you might have, suggestions, resource materials that we may not have, but you think we could use. Appreciate everything. So the bill numbers will be uh, on the legislative agenda that will be in the chat in our uh, follow-up email. I want to uh, give a shout out to whoever put together the city, Citizen Lobbyist Handbook. Yes, uh, you may have seen it, but if you haven't looked at it recently, go back. It's just a wonderful document. Liz Miranda, one of our hotshot young representatives, um, says she re refers to it on a regular basis, even though she's now becoming a seasoned representative because she thinks it's so great. Um, it, it really helps us be powerful if we know at which moments um, we can advocate for a particular bill that we like. So Susan and I will be following our bills um, to see when uh, things are moving with that particular bill. Um, this might be when um, they're uh, having a hearing vote or when they're in House Ways and Means or Senate Ways and Means or when the Senate or the House may be taking a vote, one of the final steps for these bills. Um, these are the times when we want to advocate really with a great deal of enthusiasm because lawmakers have the bills on their front burners. As Susan said, they have 7,000 bills coming before them. And it's very easy for them, even for a bill that they like, um, to kind of lose it uh, while they're dealing with other things. So the number of constituents that contact our legislators really matters, even if we know they support that bill. So we are compiling a list of women's issue supporters uh, who we can contact at various critical junctures. Um, and we want to send out not very many emails, but once in a while when something big is happening with one of our bills. If you'd like to add your name to our contact list, please put your name in the chat or email us. Uh, the ask is to just take a couple of minutes when something is moving with one of our bills um, to let your legislators know that you want uh, to, you know, their help with a bill that you really like. The league is powerful because we've got constituents, we've got league members in so many districts that um, it really spreads the power around so that um, if many of us are contacting our legislatures, legislators, um, we, we really are covering a lot of territory. So in the next few days, we'll be sending a follow-up email. And um, if you wanna think about uh, joining this uh, email uh, list we are, we are developing, um, you can send, um, uh, you'll have the information in the follow-up email to do that, to send it to one or the other of us. Um, in the meantime, we are delighted to have had the opportunity to be here with you today. This concludes uh, our presentation and uh, we wish you all the best. Bye for today.